Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je vais présenter euh, notre invité en anglais, parce que la présentation va être en anglais. Uh, ben uh, is the associate professor in the School of Biological Science, uh, University of Adelaide. He's the director of the TURN, uh, it's an um, ecological monitoring network, so terrestrial eco uh, ecology uh, research network. So he's the director of this um, um, uh, activity. And he's previously worked at uh, South Australia and Northern Territory Government Environment Agencies. So his research focuses on uh, surveillance monitoring of the Australian environment using a range of techniques, and he's going to talk about some of these techniques today. Thanks, Martin. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for coming along and listening to my presentation. So I've prepared a, a reasonably general presentation this afternoon around all of the activities, et cetera, that TURN does, um, because I, I realise that your um, research group has a lot of wide and varied interests. So if there's anything in the presentation you'd like to follow up more with, I'm really happy to have a uh, discussion with you after the presentation and go into it in more details, or in some cases refer to other people in Australia that know a whole lot more about particular parts. So I'll discuss monitoring changes in the Australian environment from across Australia's diverse environments, and we'll discuss them quite briefly. I only lead part of TURN, so there's sort of five components to TURN. I lead one of them. We've got a director that leads the whole facility, but I'll cover off on that in a little bit as well. So uh, just for starters, I thought I'd put things in a little bit of context. There's a, a nice website called Mapfight where you can quite easily see the sizes of different countries. So Australia is quite a, a reasonably sized country, um, three quarters as big as uh, Canada or about the same size as the continental US. It's quite unique in that it's a country that's also a continent. So that has some really unique ecological opportunities to study things because it's, it's isolated from the rest of the world by some huge oceans, of course. And it's really unique and geographically isolated fauna and flora. And so things, some of the environments work a little differently. I was having a discussion with Martin on the way over here how uh, I find your forest really interesting because we don't have anything remotely like that. We've got eucalypts and acacias, etc. So very, very different systems. Australia is, excuse this comment that's a little bit contradictory, but Australia is administratively simple in that we don't have, there's no land boundaries with other countries, there's no international um, uh, negotiations for anything environmentally, but in some ways it's quite complex because uh, like you guys having provinces, we've got states and largely environmental management and monitoring traditionally has been state responsibility. So you have uh, issues where, say, things happen differently, different information is collected, or different mapping occurs in different ways, or even things are defined differently across different state boundaries. So that's created quite a bit of a challenge. I'll put this slide in just to, to show you some of the, um, the diverse environments, and this doesn't cover them all. My team um, have just come back from sampling our very tiny alpine area. <laughs> um, but we have um, sort of a range of grasslands, both hummock and tussock grasslands, through um, a whole range of eucalypt and acacia woodlands, um, kinopods, so um, uh, low shrubs not unlike some of the deserts, in function not unlike some of the deserts in the southern US, I think. Um, we have Mali um, systems, which is a growth form that's kind of unique to acacias, but there are many stem trees, that many stems grow from the ground, um, through to some quite dense forests, um, typical savanna systems, um, so quite a, a range of diversity. I put this slide up, just as a, it's almost a bit of a caveat, because um, my skills are more desert ecology, so I'm not a forest ecologist. Um, as far as 
the ecology side of what I do much more comfortable in Australia's arid interior than I am in its tall forests but I can talk about them a little bit. So TURN's an organisation that was funded under a, a um, activity called ENCRIS. So it was the Australian government's response to the global financial crisis. They decided that our economy needed to be stimulated to make sure we didn't go into recession. Um, and so they focused their stimulus on infrastructure. So we bought lots of bridges and roads and a lot of hard infrastructure, road rail infrastructure, etc. But there's a tiny amount that was set aside for ENCRIS. So ENCRIS is the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Scheme. So it's a scheme designed so that researchers across the country and indeed the globe have access to good infrastructure that they need to conduct their research. That's not just ecological terms, just one of 28 facilities that are part of this scheme. So there's schemes for advanced material manufacturing. Um, there's schemes for um, a whole range of different things. Um, and each of them has, you know, yeah, microscopes, that, you know, electron microscopes that researchers can access, those kinds of things. And so the idea being that the government's idea is that infrastructure reaps dividends down the track. So researchers get to make their work more efficient by using infrastructure. Um, they collect, and in, in turn sense, we collect data at a scale and a cost that no individual group or individual research would ever be able to fund using traditional research funding. Um, and for us that means we collect information at a spatial scale across the entire continent. Um, so it's, it's general in nature, it's not designed around answering a specific research question that's of interest to a particular researcher, it's designed to create infrastructure that everyone can use that answers many questions. Um, it's founded on open data principles, so one of our mandates is that our data all has been paid for by the public, it must be made freely and widely available to the public. Um, and it provides information at a scale that perhaps hasn't been even available in the past. Certainly not without um, putting a whole lot of disparate data sets together. So our data sets are consistent across the country that allow us to address some um, national and international questions that we haven't had the ability to deal with in the past. I'll cover off on that a little more later. So specifically, turn is to integrate existing data and make that accessible um, in you know, common formats and those kind of components as well. Collect new data strategically where that's of high priority, where that's going to add information that we don't have. Um, and so in the context of our field plots and our field programs, those plots are the infrastructure and the data that come off of them is part of the infrastructure. And this is an ongoing challenge for us because the government think of infrastructure as those bridges and roads and, and me having a team of people going out and sampling vegetation doesn't quite <laughs> marry up with their concept of infrastructure and certainly not around funding formulas etc as well. And so our budget for all of TURN, the five components is TURN, about $6.2 million Australia and the exchange rate's not far off parity so that's roughly equivalent to $6.2 million Canadian dollars as well. Uh, the magnitude's important to keep in mind when you think of the size of the country and what we hope to achieve. I thought it worth just quickly discussing some of TURN's structure as well because I think that's influential on subsequent discussions. So TURN of course has a management component, as everything does, that takes care of all the, the uh, administration and organisation of uh, the whole of what TURN does for all the other capabilities. It has a landscape monitoring component now and that, so we've just recently been through a bit of a restructure, so if you're familiar with TURN in the past, um, most of what previously existed is still there in some way but it's changed to be more coherent now. So we have landscape monitoring capabilities which 
very simplistically, they do a whole lot more than this, but very simplistically is the sort of where question, where are certain things happening in the environment? And that's often the domain of remote sensing, um, GIS studies, um, uh, modelling, etc. Is, is very strong in that landscape component. There's a surveillance monitoring component which is really about what change is happening and how much of that change is happening. You know, again, big generalisations, but it, it's useful to understand the, the strengths of each of the components. And then there's a component, uh, the process monitoring component, and that really gets down to cause and effect, the, the why is certain things happening in the environment. This is our observer, those three components make our observatory component and 75% of the funding and resourcing goes to the actual on ground action. And the last component of course being integrated data delivery, management, citation, federation, search, retrieval, or everything about making the data we collect widely and easily available to the public and the global community. Um, my strengths are here, so this, this is the area I manage. I certainly have got the contacts and can talk at a high level about some of the other components, but the surveillance monitoring component is my real strength and I'll go into that in a little, little more detail now. So surveillance monitoring is a plot-based field monitoring capability that tracks the direction and magnitude of change in Australia's environment. That's our sort of key sentence that describes what we do. So we collect, to do that, we collect field information and samples, a big component of this is collecting samples as well, um, on soils and vegetation and also f um, aspirationally components of fauna. We're just beginning to look at that. In a standardised, widely agreed method across the entire continent. And to include samples that researchers can use as well, and you'll see some of that later on to address those kind of questions. What is changing? How much of that change is happening? Which direction is that change occurring in? And it has some insights into the other components, but we work really closely with those other components to address some of those, where those things occur and why they're happening as well. So in a real summary, surveillance monitoring is kind of like your fire alarm in your kitchen, um, that it sits there and alerts you if you've burnt the toast in the morning or you've burnt dinner. It's not really sensible to have the whole fire department sitting in your kitchen while you're cooking dinner because that's just not efficient use of resources. So um, it's, it's a nice conceptual way of understanding what we're doing. If, if the fire alarm goes off, then you call in the fire brigade. You, there's other types of monitoring you'll utilise when you know you've got a problem. The other thing, I'll, I'll put this in, I've cut this out of another slide because it's something that in surveillance monitoring it's not really well understood um, and so people, oh, excuse me, people often judge surveillance monitoring against criteria that would be good for targeted monitoring or criteria that would be good for landscape monitoring and just like this uh, diagram that's not necessarily reasonable, you need to judge surveillance monitoring on what it, its intended goals are, so not against something else. Sorry, I'm blocking this with my body. So our objectives is to have a national network of surveillance and baseline assessment sites across the country. We do that by setting up permanent plots. We do vegetation and soil. Um, this includes extensively spatially um, plots throughout the whole country but also more frequently monitored and, and usually closer spatial plots in areas where we're ex expecting rapid change. Um, to develop a whole process about where they are best located. To do so in a standardised way that's comparable and, and uh, you remember my diagram of Australia with the different states. One of the real strengths of this program is the same plots and the same kind of information is collected from a, a eucalypt forest in Western Australia as is in Queensland. So you can actually make direct comparisons. Previously that hasn't been possible. Um, 
And as I said, uh, samples are, are key to what we do and storing that data, making it freely available to assess that change across the continent. That's our sort of key drivers. So about our method, there's sort of just some caveats about what we've done. So practicality and pragmatism has had to prevail. So you're always trading off against what's scientifically ideal, idealistic to do, but what resourcing will allow you to do and what's pragmatic. And so we've had to make compromises there and we, we make no excuse for that. Um, and so I, I use this little statement all the time. It's not about developing the perfect method because it's kind of not really possible to do that, but rather it's about developing a good method that has wide consensus, but then understanding how imperfect that is. Our methods are modular, and we'll return to this again quickly too. So it's been designed that in, in sort of chunks that you can do in the field. So when you've got a, a large team with you, you can give certain people certain roles to do. But the advantage of that as well is that other people outside of our program can collect data in that way. And for example, if they are interested in the vegetation, they don't have to collect all the soils information we collect, but they can still use our methods, they can still make that data available and they can still compare it with other sites that we've got. My team, of course, collect all the components. It's worth covering off on history just in three quick slides because surveillance monitoring was created from three historic capabilities. The first was a um, tall eucalypt forest program that's collected about 50 hectare sites, sorry, 51 hectare sites across the country, tied in with our national forest inventory. The methods are reasonably compatible with our other programs, um, and it's, it's spatially across the country. Um, they, what's unique about these is in at each of the plots, they've actually measured DBH of every tree stem they've got in that hectare plot and they've mapped all the tree stems, et cetera, as well. What's notable, though, is that this was organised under more of a... Uh, uh, created when there was more of a research focus. So sending four people to take a week for a plot's not so sustainable anymore. So this program's been rolled into the surveillance capability we would intend to revisit these sites in another decade and look at how they've changed. We have a rangelands program. Are you familiar with the term rangelands? Yep, so primarily areas that are much more extensive, much more you know, historically used for grazing, or at least could be. Um, so that's a lot of, you know, 80% of Australia qualifies as rangelands. So there's been a whole lot of work done through there where we've collected vegetation and soils. And this, this method has evolved to be the core of what surveillance now does. That takes a team of six between... A, to, they collect between one and two sites a day depending on the conditions and how hot it is, <laughs> all those kind of, kind of issues. And there's been a transect program as well, and that specifically collected... Um, unique data, but also Ausplots along those transects. Uh, Ausplots are the, the type of the information we collect at those plots, along transition gradients, and that's become the focus of our more intensive work now. And so those three capabilities have been merged to become our surveillance capability now. This is kind of just a quick diagram that's fundamental to what we do. So this is our plot. Uh, this is uh, 100 metres, so it's a, it's a hectare plot um, with the four corners and the centre all marked with fence posts, um, metal fence posts that will remain there. These points are all pegged out and this is all laid out quite well, reasonably rapidly with the differential GPS system. And on the dotted lines we run measuring tapes along and set out the plot like that because a whole heap of work happens at different places on, on this plot now. So we collect samples of every species that occurs on that, every vegetation species that occurs on that plot, and we barcode them and we store them. They go to a herbarium to be officially identified, 
and those identifications come back and, and go into our database. And they have the right to keep them in the herbaria if they want, and by doing that they make those samples publicly accessible. If they're not of interest to them, they come back to us and we store them, and likewise down the track um, that can become publicly accessible. The real key to this being that you can go back and look at our historical data and keep its taxonomy up to date. If there's any taxonomic changes, you can go back, look at the samples and update our data so it's kept current. We take samples for genetic analysis as well. So we take you know, the equivalent of this much material and it gets put into a, a synthetic tea bag that won't have any DNA signature and barcode it again and this is tied to the actual voucher so the first sample of this comes from the actual vegetation voucher subsequent samples and other four samples if it's a dominant species come from different individuals across the plot which allows for a whole range of uh, DNA genetic analysis and a whole range of isotope analyses as well we point intercept so each of those transects every metre we, we collect the vegetation that's there, we collect what substrate we're sampling. We also collect, through vertical projection in space, we, we note every species, its maximum height, its growth form, uh, a range of information on it. You can see the team here doing this. They have a, a tape, of course, to get the metre, but there's a um, little laser pointer not a, dissimilar to this that, that marks the point and you can actually get a very accurate intersection going down and a densiometer um, here to look at the canopy. So I'm sure you're familiar with these, it's not unlike a... Okay, so this is like, the best way to conceptualise this is it's like a, a rifle sight that someone's put a 90 degree angle in. So it has crosshairs and you can see the point intercept above your above your head as you go along and sample the vegetation. We collect basal wedge information at, if you can imagine this, this is sort of diagrammatic, this is how we collect our data, but diagrammatically this is our plot as well. So this is the, the northwest corner, this is 100 metres, etc. At each of those points we do a basal wedge sweep, you're probably familiar with that. It, um, it's not unlike the prisms etc you can use as well to get a rapid estimate of basal area at each of those points and we, we record that information on a species by species basis as well. We collect some structural information uh, most accessible I guess uh, level of mapping uh, definitions, the way we describe vegetation has three strata, you can go into more detail but this is the one most commonly used and a, an ideal focus for what we're doing. So we collect the three most dominant species in the upper strata, mid strata and lower strata as well. And again, all this information, these are actually snapshots straight out of the app we collect our data from. It's all tied together, the, um, and this will be described later too. We collect LAI information which is really useful to calibrate a whole lot of remote sensing products, so that's collected across our plot. And then we collect a suite of soils information. So this is what we call our soil metagenomic samples. Nine places across our plot we take the top three centimetres of topsoil. That is put into a material bag, a calico bag. And then that's put into a, a plastic bag with silica so it's dried as rapidly as possible to dry out that material and then that becomes available for genetic analysis. And so really interestingly, I, I, just before coming here I've, I've been to New York and met with a team at Rockefeller that are they're looking at these samples to see if there's any in, um, interesting compounds in there that will have medicinal uses. So um, those samples get analysed and run through and, and um, able to determine if things are interesting there at the molecular level. Sorry, I'm blocking this again. Oh, no, I'm not. Um, where am I? Sorry. I think I'm <laughs> organised again. Uh, we, we take a whole heap of very traditional soil measures as well. So where possible, we, we dig a metre pit immediately outside the southwest corner of our plot. So we're not disturbing the vegetation in the plot, but still sampling the same soil. 
Um, here the digging was a bit tough, so we only got down to 45 centimetres. Um, we do all the traditional things like colour, um, uh, structure, all that stuff. And um, we also, this is, this is our little volunteer program. This is one of my kids sampling the bottom of the pit for me. So we take samples at 10 centimetre increments down here as well. And we record all the information of the different strata, etc. in our soil profile. And uh, collect all the traditional measurements, pH, salinity, all those kind of things at 10 depths in that pit if we get down to a metre. We also then, and again our volunteer program, unfortunately they've grown a bit since they were part of this volunteer program, <laughs> uh, but we have nine subsites across the plot as well where we just go down to 30 centimetres but we collect three, you know, uh, 0 to 10, 10 to 20 and 20 to 30 centimetres as well. And that information's um, aim to collect in different microhabitats so that we're trying to get the diversity in the top of the soil across the plot. And then we take bulk density. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's a technique that allows you to convert, sorry, it, it's a technique that takes a particular non-volume and converts that to the weight of soil. That allows you to calibrate any of your other measures through to volumetric measures, you know, how much of something occurs in a particular volume of soil. It's not the easiest thing to do in some of our sort of sandier soils, um, so we only take three of them at our pit and it's a fair bit of work to make them happen, <laughs> um, but it gives us some information that's useful there. We take photo points, and, and I'm sure everyone's familiar with photo points being a really standard ecological technique, but we do them in a bit of a different way. And when we designed this, we designed to, we, we knew that we could collect photo points in a way that would provide more information than historically has been available. So we, we came up with this method. So at the centre of our plot, we put in a star picket. This is, a, sorry, star picket, um, fencing post. Um, we put in a fencing post and then around that post we have uh, at uh, you know, 2.5 metres apart we, we put in exposure points and at these exposure points, I think, uh, no I didn't have the other slide, we take a whole series of SLR photos, so digital photography, we take a photo and then we take another photo with 50% overlap and then we take another photo until we've got a complete panorama at that point the whole way around, and then we go to the next point, and then we go to the next point. So three complete panoramas of photos. And that, that enables some um, really interesting analysis today. So hopefully, if you don't mind, Martin, I'm going to give you the job of reminding me to show the video at the end. Um, we've had some technical difficulties uh, this afternoon. So I've got a video that shows what this, this does. I'll just show it right at the end of my talk. Uh, these red dots are where we sample. So this is where the program's at spatially at the moment. We've collected across um, the, a huge range of Australia's environments. And when you put that into environmental space, which... Uh, no, I've got a slide later that does that. You'll see that it covers off on quite a reasonable amount of the variability of Australia. Still a lot more work to do. We're about to start analysis of gaps. But you can see it's a particularly extensive program. We determine where we're going to put plots based on a, a stratification procedure where we group bioregions. I mean, bioregions are areas of similar environment. We have a standard way to define our bioregions in Australia. We then group them into bioregions that are similar and then pick one to sample well. Once we're within that bioregion, we gather as much information as we can and do an analysis, a GIS analysis, and then we end up picking areas of interest that we would like to sample within. The last step is my field team go out and try and sample them with necessarily the very final decision being made out in the field. Um, We've got some great GIS layers and some areas are more arid areas we don't, but we've got some good remote sensing information, good GIS analysis, etc. You can't ever remove this last step of making a call in the field of whether our plot's located in what we're targeting it to be and whether that's homogeneous. The idea is that our hectare plot is all within the one community. 
Uh, this is just a plot showing a, a series of um, a principal component analysis, but a series of moisture related variables and a series of temperature related variables, and then all of our plots across the country, starting from our really hot, wet, tropical areas. And uh, this plot, unfortunately, uh, uh, should have updated it. It's quite old. So there's a heap more plots, and sorry, man, many, many more plots through this area now, through here, through to our really uh, coldest and wettest plots here down in Tasmania. And then a lot of, as is Australia, a lot of arid areas, the drier, warmer areas through the centre of the country. We've <laughs> focused on where we sample to address knowledge gaps and where we need new information, where there's not already existing information. And we've published on this in this book, and we've looked at um, how, how we've, we've done that, but we're about to employ much more sophisticated methods. And so um, I have a postdoc working for the second half of the year to do just that, work out where we have sampled and where we need to sample uh, for the subsequent program. Some of it by necessity is opportunistic. So because our resourcing is really tight, when opportunities present themselves, we take them. Um, so we got, um, the, this is uh, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service wanted us to do some work showing them how to sample in exclosures. So they've put exclosures in national parks where our government reversed the legislation to allow cattle in our national parks. And uh, the Park Service wanted us to show them how to monitor those areas to see what, uh, what changes were there. So we got into some areas using helicopters we would have never had access to. So that, that's a really nice collaboration. So sometimes people are really keen to help us you know, co-invest and help us collect this consistent information in their part of the world, and we're really happy to help them do that. Then the intent is that they take that on and then continue to collect that information through time. So um, about the actual method, it's really nationally accepted, and I've got a slide later that shows how we achieved that. Um, it details, all, and we've got this manual, sorry, this um, manual shows the, the core method. Uh, it details all aspects of our method. It does it in a really easy to use, well illustrated way. We're really passionate, we're, we're going to do an up, update of this soon too. But it describes why you would do that. I mean, people are so much more passionate about collecting information when they can really see why it's being collected. So it explains that and it's updated, and you can find where that is um, on the web. Um, Ozplots is a historic program that's about to be um, put into a more general turn web presence. But it's designed to go along with the training course and so and regularly updated. So in future, we will hopefully have a whole suite of these um, manuals that you can take the method that you think is of, of um, most interest to you and use the particular part and use it for your work if you wanted to and add it in with all the other things we collect as well. So there's the tall eucalypt protocol I've discussed. We've created but don't regularly collect condition protocols, environmental condition protocols, woodlands protocols, vertebrate survey protocols. They already currently exist and we intend to, and we've had people that have expressed interest to help us do this, to create fungi protocols, ground dwelling invertebrate pr protocols, um, a quicker, more rapid method for more community groups to do that we're investigating the possibility of. Um, and also then working through revisits in more detail as well. So a whole range of things coming online reasonably soon, we would hope. We're trialling new techniques. And, and um, with Martin in your group, I'm sure you've seen a whole lot of forest lighter shots before. So I didn't put one of them in. I put um, my team sitting around a campfire out in the bush as taken from a terrestrial lighter uh, instrument. But it is one of the instruments that we're, we're trialling. And we're trialling it in a way of providing research infrastructure. Can we provide this information and will, will we be able to provide this information in future to researchers in a really consistent, standardised way across the whole country so that 
you can have a whole lot of students, a whole lot of researchers, not have to write a grant and justify buying a really expensive LIDAR system to, to get this kind of information. They can use our infrastructure and they can be confident that we've collected that information in a consistent and standardised way and they can just use that and then use the money, the grant, whatever they've got for other parts to work out how to process it or whatever they want to do. So terrestrial LIDAR is one of the things we're investigating to, to do that. It's not quite at for, you know, our level, we, we're not using it operationally yet, but it's certainly at that stage where we can see that happening, not in the very distant future, that we're starting to look at how we could implement that. We've looked at drones, of course, and so this is um, a site out near Alice Springs, some of our really arid, dry country, but we've trialled fixed-wing um, UAV systems to collect imagery in our plots. Uh, and we've tried uh, little multi rotors. And I work with a, a group that works with TURN to try and make this operational as well. And here's the kind of imagery you get from that. Here you can see, excuse me, coming around to have a look at it as well. <laughs> but you can see our um, tapes laid out here in that that grid, you can sort of visualise the grid I had up before. Uh, and we're, this is the first trial where we're seeing whether we can use those intersections and GPS information from there to register that and collect this information in a standard way. Using just uh, true colour imagery, sort of standard sensors, we intend to collect this and be able to provide structure from motion as well. So uh, in a in a layperson sense, that allows us to get its structure, to look at the structure and the 3D arrangement of the forest from visual imagery. So again, a technology that is advanced enough that we're really investigating if we can start rolling this out in an operational standard way across the country. How it's achieved? Um, it's achieved through a huge range of collaboration. So when we set up this program, all the states got together, many national representatives, etc., and negotiated this out and came to a cons we, we describe it as a consensus method. Everyone got to contribute, everyone got to have their opinions heard, and we settled on a um, um, way of doing business, a method of collecting information that we describe as consensus. It's not unanimous, but most people accept that it's a really good way to collect that information across the country. This is just the beginning of a... Mm, you know, I, could, I could probably put 10 slides of collaborators on here. There's a huge amount of people that help us design how we do work, huge amount of people that actually help us do the work, huge range of stakeholders that want to use our data and, and collaborate with us to do that as well. So it's one of the more exciting things for me. And as a scientist, one of the real um, interesting things for me over my journey with TURN is that um, I've realised that so much of what we do is about people rather than just the science, that the people component is huge and so some of the um, things that we would have traditionally thought were challenging scientifically are perhaps simpler than uh, getting people in a room and trying to get them all to come up with a consensus. So that's been a challenge but it's been massively rewarding as well to see it actually work after um, a fair bit of effort. We collect the vast majority of our field information on an app and partly this has been motivated by me having appalling handwriting <laughs> and starting my career entering data into a database from field data sheets. Um, but this allows us to massively increase the speed of us collecting data. There's not a huge backlog of data to be entered when we come back from the field. There is some, but not a, not a whole lot. Massively increases the accuracy of what we collect too. There's no transcription errors for species when you've actually picked them from a drop-down list. It allows us to check data entry. It allows us to flag with the person entering that data straight away in the field if they're collecting a aspect of 400 on. Oh, doesn't make any sense. The, the, um, the app flags it straight away and asks them to put in a sensible number. So it allows us to do a heap of error checking 
Um, it allows us to tie everything together because as I showed you before, we have barcodes for everything. We photograph them and the, the app identifies the unique number for each sample, ties all the data together in the app so that we know all the samples, how they're related to each other, etc. This is just another component where we do our point intercept. So you see we from the beginning screen we pick the module, as I described before, the module, the bit of work we're doing, um, which transect we were on, what substrate we're collecting, a whole lot of information around that. There's some ways we do this information that are really useful for validating remote sensing data as well that allow us to get it um, opaque canopy cover or foliage projective cover. So um, we, we try and collect our data so it's of multi-use to different people for different purposes. Our species, etc., all come in from a pick list from things we've entered other, other places in our app as well. And this is what the whole system looks like. So we collect the data here as soon as it, it's collected in a way that it's quite possible to collect off and a lot of the time we collect offline we don't have mobile coverage throughout all those arid areas of Australia of course but when we do have coverage it sends it to a cloud-based database um, and it has a web-based front end that my team can curate when we get identifications from the herbaria etc that information can be entered and uh, or uploaded through this interface as soon as all that information's in place, it just gets you know, ticked, it gets a check that it's okay to publish, and then it's automatically sent through to two ways to, for the public to access our information, the primary one being ECOS. And this is what the ECOS website looks like. You can go there and you can then search for our data and do so in a way that you can understand some information about what's collected. This was designed based on some of the more common websites where you have faceted searching. Once you get into searching you can pick particular variables of interest and narrow things down and filter things to find the data. And here you can see sort of different data sets. But really interestingly too, you get to do so in a way you can understand how all the bits of information relate to each other as well. How particular bits of information, you know, the basal area might be collected where some other work's happening. You get to see all those relationships, etc. as well. So it's quite complex. But complex in a way that provides um, simplicity for the user, we would hope. Our data's all meant to be reusable, accessible and discoverable. That's what the RAD acronyms for. I think there's a, there's a new one now. I'm not up with the very latest. Um, so that it has maximum impact. And here's a, a publication we put out in response to uh, an article that went in Science encouraging ecologists not to publish their data so that um, it protected vulnerable species and, and this response to that article says that and indeed turn utilises a whole lot of systems to ensure that we maximise public accessibility to our data but where there is sensitive information we have ways of dealing with that, obscuring it or m um, hiding it or whatever is necessary, whatever the, the person that's best um, in the best position to make a call on that data, whatever their wishes are, we can we can deal with that. So, um, the data, you know, sensitive information can be made protected if if that's necessary. This is all based, and when I talked about people, can't speak highly enough for my team that go right across the country. They sit in four-wheel drives for days and days, getting to the farest reaches of Australia to collect this information. They're all based in Adelaide. We, we started off with a, uh, um, a situation where we had teams across the country, but that's um, on a really tiny resourcing um, that's difficult to achieve. So we have a centralised team that go across the, the country and collect all this information. So they're based in Adelaide. They take silly photos at every, every field trip that I'm obliged to share some of. Um, 
they provide consistency in data collection so because the same team's collecting this information right across the country and we regularly catch up together and make sure everything's collected in the same way and we're really comfortable that we're providing consistent data um, it's a good way to use scarce resources it would be great if we could have multiple teams but at, at the moment we're only resourced for one team um, they're well equipped, as you can see, no expense spared on our field equipment. Um, they can train others. A, a component of what we do is really training other teams out, other people wanting to do similar work. Often, for example, in this photo, these two are volunteers that have come along to learn of what we do and work with the team to, um, to achieve things. What we do wouldn't be possible without our volunteers helping us out. So they, they do a great, great job. Every trip has at least two volunteers just out there for a couple of weeks at a time helping us collect this information. We work with the state agencies across the country, etc., whenever possible. Um, and they they work with each other for two weeks on, two weeks off, for eight months of the year, they have to be very tolerant and they, they work really well together and um, can't appreciate enough how, how much of a great job they do doing that in often really hot and tough conditions when you know, things don't always go as planned. Um, because I'm on your computer here, I don't have a, I haven't got good track of how much time I'm going, so if I need to speed up, tell me to get a move on. Um, we train. So generally once a year we run a week-long training course. It's potential to extend that a bit as we add new modules. Where we do like this, we have quite a, a day where people go through every aspect of our method, why we collect it, how we collect it, the, um, all aspects of that in a theoretical sense. So the sort of classroom traditional learning kind of method. But then we take them out, we generally do this in a regional area, we take them out and we do that as well. So for the next three days, the team, and again, excuse me, coming around here, work with us doing the more technical aspects of our work for a day. They do the soils component of what we do for a day and they actually get to go out there and do it with the expert showing them how to do it and all the veg aspects of what we do for a day as well. So the sort of two modes of learning really help people to walk away with some a really good skill set around our kind of methods, etc. We hope that what we're doing has real impact on, on how science is done in the future and the kinds of questions that we're able to answer. And, and whilst our program is only um, now working towards eight years old, it was created about in, in 2010. And so a value of a long-term monitoring program increases over time. So we're really only beginning to scratch the surface of the kinds of analysis and impact these kind of data sets can have. But there's three reasonably tangible examples I'll go through quite quickly. Uh, the first being a biomass library. We created a library of all consistent, compatible data across the country and that's been used, well, been used is being used to validate um, the, the JEDI mission. So uh, a person that worked for turn has gone over to, to work at Maryland on the, the JEDI thing and um, all this data is feeding into them understanding calibrating their instrumentation for that for a, for a global program another one that we were involved with is we worked with the FAO to assess where forests occur in dry land so traditionally people haven't looked for forest in dry land areas um, they have looked for them in areas where they know forest occurs um, and so this program is to look in in more dryland areas and to assess how much forest occurred there and so this this work was published mid last year in science that did a global analysis of visual you know, assessment of imagery using um, some software that was written to go over google earth engine but what was really notable from our perspective is that our 500 or so plots assess this in the field. There was no other field information that was rapidly and easily available of the quality necessary to actually assess this against what we, what we had in the field. So 
we had, uh, along with the grid over, dry lands for the whole, um, the whole globe, we had the visual assessment done over our plots as well. So we had quality field data, we had visual assessment, and that allowed us to quite accurately specify not only how much new forest we thought occurred in dry land areas that hadn't really been accounted for before, but to quantify errors around that and do so in a really robust way. And so that resulted in us finding seven, a, little bit more, a little bit over 17 New Zealand's worth of new forest that hadn't been accounted for before, that in, in sort of the global measures hadn't really been assessed as forests before. Um, Sorry, I haven't had a chance to update this into something that's perhaps a little more meaningful. And out of our data, we've started to do some analysis on the kinds of weeds occur and which plots they occur in and that kind of thing. And so interestingly, two-fifths of our plots have no weed species recorded in them, which is quite exciting. I, I wouldn't have... Um, I wouldn't have suggested that. But uh, it also enables us to find out what species are where and, and more importantly, track that through time as we go back and do revisits. Um, our outputs, we hope, will influence policy and management. So, as I said, it's still early days, but they're used currently for validating a whole range of remote sensing products to input and inform on rangeland management programs for taxonomy, so there's potential for uh, new species and certainly we know of range extensions happening already. Our data's input into climate models. Um, the government is keen on us to help influence future state of our environment reporting. Um, we can form on soil crust, etc. And this here is kind of a bit of a cop out because there's just so many opportunities that we just haven't even had the chance to explore yet. The one where we're working with a team from Rockefeller to look at interesting compounds in our soil is not one we'd ever anticipated or had remotely um, guessed could have happened at the beginning of the program. And it's enabled a heap of publications and the point I think that's most interesting about there's some you know notable and exciting publications in here but this is the research infrastructure so this isn't my team doing all these publications they are researchers from across the country and increasingly getting wider and wider uptake of people using our data that we don't even know about really until it's published and we would like to, we perhaps need to do a better job of tracking how it's used. But it, it's also quite rewarding that other groups are taking up our data and, and using that. Often groups come to us to collaborate and help get us to help interpret that data, but it's by no means necessary if they want to use our data. There's just a standard acknowledgement they need to use, and, and that's it. If they, they come to us and want help, and etc., we often do. We often help people with interpreting their analysis or whatever. A big part of what we do is about getting the message out too. So there's a whole lot of presentations, workshops, targeted presentations, briefings of ministers, etc., websites, conference presentations, the whole, the whole uh, newsletter articles, a whole range of things so that people have the information on what we're doing and try and mm, give it wider um, acknowledgement. Getting to the last few slides now, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, we have a huge range of samples, so in total, these, sorry, I apologise, the, these, um, these figures are old. In some total, we're getting close to 100,000 samples we now store. Um, so there's around, I think, we're up to 40,000 voucher samples. There's um, more than that of soil samples. We keep all the soils in our, you know, they're in the floor below us in, in our offices, as are our genetic material. There's a room where we store our genetic material the herbarium samples etc and they're available for people to use and we try and publicize that because people aren't always aware that there's these samples here and then they can have access to them if they want to use them they just write an application to us there's a form they fill out that particularly is interested in if it's destructive sampling we want to know that it's being used for a reasonable purpose 
the only one I've ever knocked back was a student that um, wanted to use our samples to test a method. And interestingly, I had the species that he was after growing in my garden and offered him to use that, uh, which he, he sourced from somewhere else. But he came back to us after he'd got his method, genetic work, after he'd got his methods nailed down, he then used our samples and a wider analysis, and we're really happy with that. So where can you find more information on this? Um, currently, we're in a bit of a transition phase at TURN. So there is the TURN website. A lot of the specific information on our methods, etc., is still at this location. But over the next year or so, it will be converted over to the, the general TURN website. And there's um, information on um, all the kinds of things I've discussed. But also, uh, if you want to contact me directly about anything, I'd love to help you out. If there's anything of interest there, certainly um, drop us an email or, or call if we can arrange a time when um, is suitable or whatever. Really happy to, to do that. Uh, that was a slide I wasn't going to use. Um, so that's the end of my talk. I just ha do have a couple of little presentations uh, at little videos at the end here. Each are only a couple of minutes. Um, the first just simply being some of the drone imagery we collected over our plot. And as you can see, this is it um, moving across our plot. And you can see the tapes there, etc., that we're using to register things. So you can. Um, I thought that might just be interesting that the Australian, it's a eucalypt woodland is quite different to some of the things you've probably dealt with. Um, so, and there's the team. <laughs> um, so that's the kind of information we're starting to now process and see what information can be extracted from that. The other, if I can get out of this, uh, what am I doing here? Right, the other's just a short video that demonstrates, and you can find this on YouTube because we've had to do that today too, demonstrates the kinds of information we get out of our photo point method. Um, and in a few seconds it will go and demonstrate how that happens. So as I described, it takes a whole lot of exposure points. But then I wanted to show this video just so you can see that um, in a minute you'll see the 3D reconstruction that we're able to do just from standard photography. So um, that'll be along in a few seconds. But uh, in the meantime, um, thank you for letting me come and talk to you. It's and, and been great. I'm sorry I've, I've spoken for an hour straight now, so hopefully no one's too bored. Um, but if you've got any questions or uh, want to follow up on anything, I'm happy to hang around and uh, discuss any of those aspects with you, so thank you. There we are. So you can see a sort of 3D rec and this, and this is a video we created about four or four and a half years ago now, but you can see we can um, create a 3D structure model of the plot and we can measure basal area out of these photographs without having to to go out in the field and actually do it. Well, we go out in the field, but you know, techniques available that we can measure basal error from the photography.